Here's what I want to do this morning. Uh, for, for your word this morning, I want to uh, just back up a little bit um, from some of the things that we shared last week, particularly one thing to kind of put an end cap on what we've been talking about with this whole issue of crossing the Jordan to get into the land of Canaan. Uh, something that the Lord would not release from my spirit. So I won't be before you long, but I just want to share a couple of things to hopefully encourage you and to help you, uh, just like it's helping me, to identify who the real enemy is. Does that make sense? Who the real enemy is, because if we're not able to recognize who the real enemy is, even in context of what we've been talking about with the whole issue of uh, Joshua and then um, moving into today, we will fight the wrong battles. Come on, say amen, y'all. If we don't know who the enemy is, we will end up fighting the wrong battle. So it's very, very important that we take a moment just to talk to that so we can get to where God would have us to go. Now here's, let me, let me begin here, then I'm going to go to Joshua, and then I'm going to come back into the New Testament. Because I want to review some of the principles that I shared with you last week, hopefully to illumine some things so we can, can continue to move on. Um, does anybody in here know that the Bible teaches us clearly that we are not each other's enemy. You guys look like, oh, man, no, I, I wanted him to be my enemy because I was going, no, 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 no. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, you're not my enemy. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, you're not my enemy. Yeah, it says, so listen carefully to how I'm going to say this. Okay, very, very important that you understand this because I want to show you in light of what it says in the, in, in the, in the uh, Old Testament. The Bible puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 6, right, um, verse 10. Um, Be strong in the Lord, it says finally, and put on the whole armor of God so that when the day, listen to this, the day of evil comes, you will be able to take your stand. Okay? Now, it's not saying that in the event that it comes, it says when it comes, you'll be able to take your stand. And then it continues by saying the wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and the, the spirits of the rulers of darkness in high places, right? Um, and it talks about putting on the whole armor of God so we can make it. Very, very important that you not miss that. So, Because what I want you to understand, that I am not your enemy. Your neighbor is not your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. Your co-worker is not your enemy. Your neighbor, as shockingly as it may seem, is not your enemy. Your cousin, your Aunt Betty, she's not your enemy. All right? Here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, um, that be sober, be vigilant, because Satan is going around like a roaring lion doing what? Seeking whom he may want. Yeah, that's, that's his job. That's his job. So Ephesians says, when the day of evil comes, have on the whole armor so we can stake our stand because the wrestle is not against each other. It's not against flesh and blood. And then Peter says that, that the enemy now, that which is Satan, he goes around looking for people who has their guards down so he can get them. Okay, that's what Peter says. Anybody ever heard the term haters? Yeah. Here's what we say. I got haters, right? Don't act like you hadn't said it, right? <laughs> and and, 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 and let, me, let, me, let me clarify that as we walk through this this morning because it will put things in framework for the love of God. I'm going to be clear here. You don't have haters. You have a hater. Okay? The rest is not against flesh and blood but against principalities. Put on the whole army of God because the enemy is a roaring lion, goes around to seek who he may devour. You don't have haters. You have a hater. Okay, so here's what the hater does. He finds people through whom which he can work, and he uses them to hate you. And because you don't recognize who it is working through them, you say, we have haters, and you fight the wrong battle. <laughs> we do, we do, we do, we fight the wrong battle. But I want you to recognize you don't have haters, you have a hater, okay? You have an accuser of the brethren who will go about, because here's the thing that I want you to hear as we kind of make the switch back to Joshua now. 
The goal of the enemy is to prevent you from inhabiting your Canaan. The goal, of the, the goal of the enemy is to continually remind you of where God brought you from. The goal of the enemy in my life and in your life and in all of our lives is to prevent us as a ministry, as individuals, as just people on the earth from realizing what God has caused us to do. So because, let, let me just go here, because he doesn't have direct access to you, and I'll flesh that out one of these days, okay? He will use people that he knows you trust that have access to you and cause them to get to you. Yeah, yeah. Nobody in here can tell me when was the last time you were in your bedroom and the, bed, the devil showed up in your bedroom and said, what's up? But you can tell me when the last time, listen to the term, a human being got on your reserve nerve. You can tell me when it was the last time that a human being offended you. You can tell me when the last time was that a human being spoke about you, be it maliciously, be it degrading, be it whatever. You can tell me when the last time it was. And I want you, what I want you to understand, if you can really get this in your spirit, especially if you are a child of God, it's not the human coming at you. It's the human availing themselves for the enemy to work through them. I need somebody in here. To get to you. So I want us to be cognizant. I want us to be cognizant because here's what the devil will do. He will reintroduce the reproach of Egypt into your life to delay progress into our destiny. And if we don't recognize that, we will keep that vehicle close by. And anytime the enemy wants to get to you, he'll enter the vehicle, drive up right next to you, and get on your nerves. And here's, here's what we'll say. Haters. No, it's not haters. If you're a child of God, it's a hater. And you need to recognize how he's getting to you. All right? So here's the important now of cutting certain things off. This is where we were last week because it will delay progress into destiny. I'm going to move, I'm going to move very, very fast because I really want us to really understand um, what I'm saying and, and walk through the text. So here's what, here's what the message looks like last week, right? Here's how I begin. To continue the path to success in 2018, there must be a cutting away of anything that hinders progress and attaches itself to our past. Okay? So and let, me, let me just keep going here. Number one, we got to cut some things off, and here's what this means. Cutting away prevents our future from being tainted with the sins of our past. Number two, we saw the cutting away sometimes must occur in the lives of those who walk with us during the journey. Thirdly, the cutting away must be done with haste as delays could cause another missed deadline. Okay? Very, very important. So we're talking about 2018. I'm talking for me and for our leadership and our board in the context of ministry. God has a vision for us. We have to get there for you in the context of your personal life, in your business life, in your social life, in your marital life. And I'm trying to say to you, we will not continue to make progress if we allow the hater to continually have, to have access to us because his goal is to remind you of who you are not in an attempt to delay progress. So you got to cut them off. Does that make sense? Okay? And, and here's how I said it by way of the introduction. He won't come to you directly. He'll use people's circumstances and situations to get to you. That's what he'll do. That was the whole premise of, of the introduction. So we must be able to cut those things off. We must be able to get rid of them because it will cause delay. Okay? So, so when you go to Joshua chapter 5, and, and, and let me just read this text in Joshua 5, give you some context, and I'm going to jump back to the New Testament. Once the cutting away is complete, we can begin the process of dealing with the shame of our past. This thing, I could not shake it out of my spirit as much as I wanted to, because the thing that's keeping the majority of us from being involved in what God would like us to be involved in is, be, is the pain of yesteryear, okay? Let me, let me bring it closer. The reason a lot of us are still not married today, even though we've been married before, is because we have not overcome the pain of the last marriage. Can we be honest this morning? 
Yeah, the, the, reason, the reason a lot of us are still in the predicament that we find ourselves in, be it financially or be it otherwise, is because we have not yet dealt, let me use the scriptural text, with the, the reproach of Egypt, the shame or properly dealt, uh, we haven't been completely healed yet. And when, when our mind goes there, it reminds us of what happened and we're afraid to go forward. Okay, I want to encourage everybody this morning to realize you are not who the devil is telling you you are. You are who God created you to be. That's what I want y'all to hear me say this morning. Because if there's one thing he will do is he will continue poking you. He'll continue reminding you. He will create circumstances to frustrate you. He'll create all kinds of things in your life to delay you. And here's the problem with that. You're standing on the brink of Canaan, but you won't make forward progress because every time you take a step, here's what he's going to do. Send people. And, and, and I want you this morning at the end of this message to say to him, guess what, booger? Yeah, that's what his name is. You can't use people no more because I know what the car looks like that you drive up in. <laughs> I'm enjoying this all by myself. <laughs> so when he or she come, you just look at the car. I've seen that model before. Who's in the driver's seat? Oh, uh, you ain't... <laughs> Click, 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 click. <laughs> you kind of get what I'm saying? And if you understand that, it doesn't matter what the car says. You're going to know who the driver is. Are you guys getting this? Come on. Uh, let me, let, if you're not getting the turn of said, neighbor, tell me what he's talking about, right? Because I want you to get this. I want you to get this. Is that he will, the restless, not flesh and blood. It's not haters. It's the hater. Okay? So, so notice, go to Joshua chapter 5. Let me look at this one passage that we're going to jump over. I want to encourage people this morning so we can um, move and be who God would have us to be. So Joshua chapter 5, okay? And I'm going to give you just a little bit of context. And then we're going to move very, very fast uh, because I'm going to share with you a passage that you already know. And hopefully it will just encourage you. So Joshua 5, uh, jump down to verse 8. I'm not going to read the pretext because we already did that for several weeks now. So I want to get right to this place. And you can always go to the podcast. You can download the app. You can uh, get online and catch up with us. Verse 8, say amen if you're there. When the circumcision of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their place in the camp until they were healed. And notice what it says. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place was called Gilgal. Gil to this day. Jump down to verse 10. And while the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month uh, in the eve, on the evening on the plains of Jericho. In the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, and that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased or the manna stopped the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan. Jump back to verse 9. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal. Here's all I want you all to yell at me. Say no more. No. Come on, say it again. I'm like, make me feel good. Come on, say no more. No. Say it again. Say no more. No. Okay. Here's what I'm going to say to my lovely wife. And I love her, so don't nobody take this. You ain't going to never get under my skin again. No more. Fellas, you ought to be like me, bold, and just say, reach over and say that to her. Don't do it. Don't you dare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. No, really, 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 really. Because here's what the Lord revealed to me today. It ain't her. Yeah. Come on, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm hoping the Lord reveals the same thing to her, that it's not me. You kind of get what I'm saying? Because if I don't come to that recognition, I won't properly heal and I won't deal with the reproach of Egypt and it will prevent me from going into my destiny because the moment I hear anything that looks like yesterday, I get flashbacks. Come on, y'all. Pride, all that. I know I'm not just talking to myself. You drive by the house and you get flashbacks. Come on, y'all. 
Yeah. You go to your bank account and that monthly withdrawal, Jesus, and you just like, you, you forget that you're saved. Can we be honest this morning, right? This is what the, the Israelites had to deal with, okay? If, if we had time, I would take you to Genesis chapter 32, I mean Exodus chapter 32, and here's what's happening in Exodus chapter 32, right? Moses is on the mountain, and Moses is in the presence of God and is receiving the word of the Lord um, from God himself. The Israelites are down on the ground, and because Moses did not come down to Mount Sinai fast enough, here's what they said. We need to take, choose another leader, and we need to go back to Egypt because apparently God cannot do what God said he's going to do. This is what's going on. And so here's what God's conversation with Moses in the mountain. God is saying to Moses, Moses, I'm going to kill them all. This is what's happening. Exodus chapter 32. And here's God, Moses' dialogue to God. Mos, God. He says to God, God, if you kill them, here's what the Egyptians are going to say. You took them out of Egypt and you weren't strong enough to deliver them into their place of promise. So to defend your name, you just kill them all off. And God said to Moses, you tripping now. And, 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 and here it is. And he saved their lives. He saved their lives. But because it took 40 years for them to get in, every nation on the face of the earth the Egyptians would watch them wandering for 40 years, and here's what they say, y'all ain't never going to get in. Your God can't do what God said he's going to do. Y'all look like a bunch of fools out there trying it. Well, don't act like you hadn't heard this, all right? You're looking at the guy that when I was a senior in high school, I'll never forget, my shop teacher said to me, boy, you too dumb to be an engineer. He sure did. He sure did. He sure did. When I graduated, I walked right back to that island. I knocked on his shop door. Degree in how you like me now. <laughs> I sure did. I, I, I had issues. I had issues. I had issues. But I'm sure you've heard somebody say you'll never get that business off the ground. I'm sure, sure you've heard somebody says you'll never get over that addiction. You'll never get over that situation. You'll never get over that circumstance. You're going to be certain way. Come on. You've heard that. You've heard that. And what they're really saying to you is God cannot do what God said he's going to do in your life. And I want to encourage us all this morning to realize that we serve a God that's able. We serve a God that's able. And I also want us to realize that if it seems as if God is not doing what God said he's going to do, don't pray harder. Check yourself for a little while to make sure you've made the adjustments. Because I am my biggest impedance when it comes for God working through me. The problem is not the word that God released because Scripture is clear in Isaiah. His word cannot go back void and say, hey man, God, I know Felix, his head is pretty hard. This word you release is not going to work on him. Because God's going to say, you got the wrong God. Go back down there and do what I told you to do. I am the impedance, not God. And what God is saying, for me to reap the benefit of the land, the produce of the land... There's some cutting off that's got to take place. And I'm trying to teach you this morning to recognize the driver, not the vehicle. <laughs> because the reason I'm saved is because God recognized the driver, not the vehicle. Yeah. And he went to Calvary so the vehicle can have access to him. And he dealt with the driver on the cross. And he wants to do the same thing today. Does that make sense? So, 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 so here, 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 here he says, today he says, I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from Israel, from, from the nation of Israel. And so here's the question, if I'm an Israelite, I'm asking these questions, okay, God, so why would you let me go through all that stuff? And listen to this, because I needed to use what you went through so you can help somebody else who's going through the same thing. Why didn't you just deliver me from the wilderness? Why you had to let me stay there 40 years? Because somebody else is going to disobey me. And in the 40 years wandering, they're going to give up. And I need you to go back in the wilderness and tell them, don't give up. He may not come when you want him to, 
but he's always, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so sometimes he delays, sometimes he won't show up when we want him to, and, 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 and we make the mistake of wallowing in yesteryear, blaming vehicles, blaming ourselves, blaming all that stuff, when the whole time God is working. And I'm trying to encourage you and encourage me and encourage all of us in the moment of failing. It doesn't mean that God is no longer there. He is there the whole time. Be encouraged through it all. So even in the wilderness wandering, the only reason you're still walking is because he's still providing manna. The only reason you're still walking is because he's providing water. Come on. He has the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He's still guiding you even in the wilderness. And so now you're on the brink. He wants to move at a different place or cut some things off, okay? So, so I want you all to understand this with me, and then we're going to move real quick. Come on, say divine providence. divine providence. Say it again. Say divine providence. divine providence. You've heard about providence if you've been at this church any length of time, so let me summarize it like this. Providence, then, is a series of events occurring for a specified purpose in the life of an individual, preparing them for the next series of events to transpire in their life. Okay, so see, here's what that meant. I went through what I went through yesterday so I can better handle where I am today. And I'm going through what I'm going through today so I can be positioned to handle what I'm going to face tomorrow. That's providence, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so, so everything God takes us on is a journey for how he ultimately wants to use us. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. Because if I don't process that well, I'll look back into what I did yesterday and I'll deal with the shame of it when God says to me, hey, baby, I forgave you. And I'm going to use that for tomorrow. Oh. And if I don't properly heal and deal with the reproach of Egypt, the enemy is going to enter a vehicle and he's going to drive up next to me and he's going to say, you ain't no good. That's why you did that thing. And I'm going to go back and live there. Yeah, you right. Right? Does this make sense? So, so let me say this. I'm just summarize this in this way, and then we're going to move, move to the lesson. If you look all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, I don't know that with the exception of Jesus, which is God himself incarnated, that God used a perfect person to do anything. He used people just like you, and he used people just like me. Come on, y'all. Tell your neighbor he used people like you, too. Come on, tell him. Make him feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he used people like you, too. Yeah. Very, very important. Very important. Very important. Very important. Because if you look at it, when, when you start looking at the Abraham, a liar, right? Manipulator. Come on. Can I talk about that? When, when you look at Jacob, a deceiver. Come on. Going down to David, a murderer. Come on. An adulterer. On and on and on. Paul himself, a murderer. Peter himself, a liar. Never does he use perfect people to accomplish his will. But if you study Scripture, you'll see the providential intervention of God at work that even in their failing, when they cut off what caused the failure, they were positioned for the next step and they were stronger the next step that they made. And when they dealt with that, they were positioned for the next step such that at the end of the journey, here's what they said, in all things, God worked together for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. You can tell me what I did yesterday all you want. I'm going to cut you off and say he worked it out for my good. You can tell me how crazy I was yesterday all you want. I'm going to cut you off and say, but he worked it out for my good. I wish I had somebody in here because somebody's not encouraged this morning and you need to hear me say he worked it out for your good. For your good. Because he has greater purpose. He has greater destiny. But in the moment you got to deal with the reproach of Egypt. Come on, does this make sense? Cut it off, cut it off, cut it off, cut it off and begin the healing and take the step. And when the vehicle shows up, check the driver out. Before you so quick to go off, check the driver. And then here's how you can help the vehicle. You know who's behind your wheel? 
You ain't even got to argue with them. Because this is why I said no more. Because what I do, I want to argue back. I want to fight my, defy, come on, y'all, defend myself. I'm going to say, you going to let him drive? <laughs> and I'm going to keep going on. It's on you if you leave him behind the wheel or not. That's on you. I ain't saying nothing about nobody. I ain't saying nothing. Are you with me? But do you get this? I'm not going to allow you to take me back to where God brought me from because I know where God has taken me. Does this make sense? So, so, so go to Romans. Go to Romans 8. I'm almost there. Go to Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. Let me just give you a couple of scriptures this morning and we can walk through this. This, 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 this 75 minute service ain't working too well when I get excited, amen. But it'll be all right. Because I know some of y'all watching your clocks, amen. Yeah. Yeah. Romans 8, Romans 8. Jump down, jump down to verse 28. Yeah. Yeah. Let me encourage you with this and go home and, and flesh it out and dig it out because we don't have time to deal with the theology of all this. You guys are there? Look at verse 28 says, and we know, I'm in the ESV for those who love God. All things work together for good. Okay. God loved those. They work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And I like this. Verse 29 says, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Man, I w- oh, Jesus, I got to deal with that. In order, it says, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified... He what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then look at this. Verse 31 says, I'm gonna, I have to explain that. Y'all have to be patient with me. What shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be what? He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And then I like verse 39. Let me paraphrase. Here's what that says. Which car has the nerve to pull up next to me with that crazy driver? And tell me what I'm not going to be. <laughs> right? That's what the, Who shall bring any charge? You guys see that? Against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that was raised. Who is at the right hand. Indeed interceding for us. What it says shall separate us from the love of God. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or the sword, as it is written for your sake, it says we are being killed all the day long and regarded as sheep to the slaughter. I can't even get to verse 37. In all these things, he says, we are more than conquerors through him who what? Loved us. For I am certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come. Come on, y'all. Nor powers, nor height, nor debt, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Here's what that says, y'all. Here's what that says. And I I really do have some points I need y'all to see. But here's what that says. In my worst mess up. God does not turn his back on me because he wasn't shocked when I messed up. He's just saying to me, hurry up and cut it off so you can make the next step. But here's his grace. He's patient enough that if it takes 40 years for me to cut it off, I'm waiting on you. He's going to wait. I wish I had somebody in here. He's going to wait patiently on me. And let me tell you why I'm saying that. I'm going to share you my points. Here's what you need to know. Here's what Romans says. Before the world began, God sat sat in heaven in his triune glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and said, let us make men. Let us make them in our image, after our likeness, and let's create jobs for them to do. So before Genesis 1-1 began, February 24th, 1960, he was planning me out. Before Genesis 1-1 began. Y'all missed that. Yeah. Yeah, he's outside of time, yet he operates in time. Thank you for that line. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And so, so here's what that means. Here's what that means. Before he said, let there be and there was, all of us were created. And we existed in his mind with him. 
And he had a preordained purpose for each and every one of us. And does anybody know when God says it, that settles it, and no driver of no vehicle can this, ah, it's going to change what God said. The reason you're here listening to me this morning is because his word proved true. Come on, y'all. Because you didn't think you were going to make it. But because he thought it, when he spoke it, it came into existence. So when he released me, here's what Romans says. No demon in hell could stop that boy from doing what God called him to do. And I want you to hear me say the same thing about you. No demon in hell can stop you from doing what God created you to do. And listen to this. No driver of no vehicle should make you feel unloved by God because if God didn't love you, he wouldn't create you. Come on. If God didn't love you, he wouldn't give birth to you. If God didn't love you, he would not say let there be and there was. Ah! And so now you're here. And here we are not understanding the love of God. And we waddling in our mess. Feeling sorry for ourselves. When God is saying, cut it off. I love you. Come on with me. Enter into your Canaan. But we want to hang on to yesterday. Are you with me? Fighting the wrong battles. Dealing with cars versus pulling the driver out from behind the steering wheel. Let me say this and then we're going to pray. Here's what I want you all to hear. Here's the assurance of divine providence. Number one, 3A, God foreknew you. Okay? Here's what this means. I wish you all were here on Wednesday. I said it this way. To know God is to be known by God. That's what I said on Wednesday night. Very heavy, heavy state. We're still processing it. What that means, there's nothing you did that God didn't know you were going to do it before you did it. Some of y'all are like, he saw me with that blunt? <laughs> and he do you is going to go to store before they put it up there on Smoky Hill. Yeah. <laughs> He knew, he knew. You can't, but, but here's the good news. It didn't change his love for you. Isn't that comforting, guys? Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. It didn't change his love. He knew, he knew, he foreknew us, right? And, but even in spite of his foreknowledge, he's still predestined, okay? I'm going to take that one. I'm going to use that one. He's, here's what he says. We all have an opportunity, John 3, 16, to respond to his love. Isn't that good news? In spite of him knowing how we're going to mess up. He still chose us. Oh, my gosh. I wish my family could love me like that. And then he does what? When the time is right, he calls. Hey, Derek, you can stop now. Dang, Pam saw me? No, Pam didn't see you. God did. And he called. And by virtue of the fact that you're here, it means you heard his voice. And you respond, oh, come on, that's good news, y'all. And you responded, come on, come on. You did like, you did like Moses. Some of us, we had a conversation, who are you? I'm the God of your grandmama, really? And he had to take you through some things. Well, prove to me you got, okay, you're going to get in a bad accident, and I'm going to bring you out. Yeah, yeah, y'all not hear me. Yeah, yeah. You're going to file for bankruptcy, and I'm going to bring you out. You're going to go through a rough divorce, and I'm going to bring you out. You're going to get sick with cancer, and I'm going to bring you out. Just so you could know that I'm God, because I called you. I called you. And then watch this. And then he justified me. We don't have time to deal with these words, okay? Meaning that now when he looks at me, he doesn't see the old me because he's dealt with the reproach of Egypt. He sees a person washed in his blood. Hallelujah, Jesus. And then he glorifies me. Here's what glorify says. Y'all need to look these scriptures up. Even though I'm on earth, he already got me in heaven with him. <laughs> so I ain't got to worry about whether I'm going to make it in or not. 
because I existed with him before I showed up on the earth. And he's saying, I am guarantee you're going to come back, baby. Oh, oh, come on. Is this making sense? He glorified me. So everything I go through on earth, here's providence, it all works together. It all works together. Y'all, and, and I'm gonna, not going to make it, but I need to talk about this real quick. So providence guarantees that God works out everything for our good, right? Y'all don't know Greek, but say it. says soon ergeho. Say it. Just pretend you know Greek. Say it. Say soon ergeho. Here's what that means. Works together. Illustration. Best illustration I can give you for soon ergeho is a person in a boat, and they have two oars in their hand. Okay. And you set one oar down, and life is in the hand here, and you decide to use one oar, right? Guess what's going to happen if you're rowing with one oar? Yeah, you get it. You get it. All day long. No forward progress. All day long, right? That's because I am working life by myself all day long. And I wonder why I'm repeating the cycle over and over again. I am working life by myself. God says, let me work with you. And then when he works with me, all of a sudden I got two oars. I wish I had somebody working together. And progress can be made when I stop working life by myself and allow him to work life with me. I have two oars. Does this make sense? That's all that Greek verb means is that it works together, okay? I'm almost there. I'm almost there. So here's the result. You have God on your side, okay? God has great things in store. And lock into this, no demon in hell can false you, accuse you before God. Let me tell you why. And this is free. It's because Romans 8, and we didn't have time to look at all the verses, God is sitting in heaven making intercession for you. Christ, okay? So here's what that means. Here's what that means. Remember one time, remember one time, remember one time, uh, Jesus was having a business meeting in, in, with in heaven, in Job, and then Satan showed up. Y'all remember this, right? And here's what God says. Hey, Satan, what you, what you, who invited you? Security guard must be on break today. How you make it up in here? And he says, man, I just, ain't nobody else on earth. I got everybody on lock. I mean, I can show up in any vehicle I want, and I just got them jacking each other up, and they fighting the wrong battle. Look at me, and they fighting each other. See them down there? See them? And God says, yeah, but... Job over there ain't fighting nobody. And he's like, yeah, I can't get to him. How come, Satan? Because he's learned how to recognize a driver. <laughs> Blind his eyes so he can't see the driver and watch what I'm going to do to him. Y'all get this now? You get this? The shield that's around him. Does that make sense, right? And so here's what happens. Whenever an accusation is made in heaven, Jesus in health is standing there interceding on my behalf. Now, the reason I like that is because if God is praying to God for me, <laughs> come on, y'all. I'm not talking about you praying. I'm not talking about my mama praying. Now, I'm one of those guys that believe my wife has direct access to God because when she pray for stuff, it just be happening. I'm like, dang, girl. I mean, it doesn't matter what she pray for, God does it. I'm like, dang. What I, and, 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 and God is saying, I don't even need her praying for you. I've got you. That's heavy. Christ is interceding. And look at E, 5E, nothing can change God's plan for us. So here's how I need to walk around on earth. I am more than a conqueror. I'm, I'm done, but hear this. You are more than a conqueror. Does this make sense? Point to yourself and say, self, doesn't matter what it looks like right now. I am more than a conqueror. Come on, that's very, very important. One more time, say, self, it doesn't matter what it looks like right now. I am more than a conqueror. That is so important, y'all. So next time the car pulls up, just look in the window. And if it ain't Jesus, <laughs> no, she didn't. No, that's not, that's, that's not necessary. Who driving? You get this? 
And you just wreck, oh, no wonder. Then you, then, then you really make him feel bad. You realize who's in your car? <laughs> and we can be who God would have. It's really that simple. We're more than conquerors. And we can deal with the reproach of Egypt because God's not holding nothing against us. So what does hinder with us from being who God would have us to be? Bow your heads with me. Lord, I'm grateful. I'm grateful, God. I am grateful for everything you've done, for how you move, God. So I just take a moment to worship you. I take a moment to celebrate you. I take a moment to give you glory for who you are and what you've done. So be God in our midst, Lord. We thank you for this fresh word. As you begin steps to eating the produce of the land, tomorrow cannot look like yesterday. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You have a great destiny for us, God. Every person in this place. We walk in boldness, God. Thank you for what you do and thank you for who you are and what you've been. My prayer today, God, is if there's one that's here that's dealing with the shame of yesterday, I'm praying that they get released today based on this word, God. That you set them free and realize that what they did yesterday does not define who they are today. Nor where you're going to take them tomorrow. Nor your purposes for their lives. Thank you for being God, Lord. Thank you for this freeing word. Thank you for justifying us. And then the fact, God, that we're already glorified. So teach us to live in the world but not be of it. So should there be one here that needs to say yes to you, speak, God. Draw them, draw them, draw them, draw them, God. Give our hearts to you, God. Forgive us for wallowing. Forgive us for negative talk. Forgive us for bad-mouthing. Forgive us for allowing Satan to ride in our vehicle. Forgive us, God. Even though he can't get any influences, forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. We love you and we give our hearts and time to you. You be glorified. In your name we pray. Amen.